Hi, I'm Sarah Butcher, and this is The Side Comment. On this episode, Herman Beck examines the multitude of previously unrecognized anti-Semitic attacks that occurred prior to the Holocaust. His new book, Before the Holocaust, revises the standard assumptions among historians that physical violence against Jews in Nazi Germany first reached a peak in November 1938 with Kristallnacht. The following is a synopsis of the research presented in my book Before the Holocaust. An enormous wave of anti-Semitic violence swept Germany only weeks after Hitler's rise to power. Neither its volume nor its brutality has been sufficiently recognized. Historians traditionally argued that anti-Semitic attacks in Nazi Germany rose gradually, from low levels during the first years of Hitler's rule to a high point in the nationwide pogrom of November 1938, the Reichskristallnacht. Before the Holocaust, based on research in more than 20 German archives, demonstrates that this assumption is incorrect. Taken together, the documents I found in German archives tell the appalling and largely unknown story of massive anti-Semitic assaults in the winter and spring of 1933, that is, at a time when protests by German elites might have stopped the attacks and thus possibly altered the course of history. Before the Holocaust examines the multitude of these previously unrecognized anti-Semitic attacks as well as the reaction of German elites and institutions to this violence. The first part of the book focuses on types of anti-Semitic violence, from boycotts, physical assaults, robbery, extortion, abductions, and humiliating pillory marches to severe bodily harm and murder. The second part concentrates on the reactions to anti-Semitic crimes by elites in those institutions that still had the capacity to protest against Nazi attacks. The first targets were foreign Jews living in Germany, in particular the so-called Ostjuden. Most of the victims were Polish Jews. The Polish embassy in Berlin alone reported hundreds of violent attacks against Polish citizens in March and April 1933. These reports included raids on restaurants, the smashing of shop windows, robbery, blackmail attempts, extortion, kidnapping for ransom, and the forced closure of shops to eliminate unwelcome competition. Most of the attacks took place in Berlin and the larger cities of Saxony and the Rhine province where the majority of foreign Jews resided. They were carried out by Nazi stormtroopers, many in auxiliary police uniforms and thus invested with state authority. The situation was different with German Jews. Here, the estimated number of unknown cases was much higher since no consulate or diplomatic mission recorded the crimes. This meant that attacks remained unknown unless victims succeeded in reporting the attacker to the police. Crimes against German Jews began with local anti-Semitic boycotts. These had a long tradition, reaching back into the late 1800s. They were revived during the Great Depression and culminated in the nationwide boycott of April 1st against Jewish shops and lawyers and doctor's offices. In many localities, they continued for weeks after the 1st of April. Contrary to what is commonly believed, it is not true that the actual day of the boycott passed without major incidents. I found evidence of numerous attacks on April 1st. Another widely practiced category of anti-Semitic crime was the abduction of Jewish businessmen, doctors and other professionals, coupled with severe maltreatment and threats of murder. Victims were assaulted, kidnapped and often held for days in the torture cellars of the SA. A particularly insidious form of violence was the pillory march and public branding in its various forms. Victims were forcibly paraded through towns by a posse of Nazi stormtroopers and forced to wear signs around their necks that marked them as supposed swindlers and racketeers, labels that fed into typical anti-Semitic prejudices. 
These pillory marches were often instigated by Nazi stormtroopers who knew victims personally. Branding of a different kind can be found in newspaper articles that listed names, addresses and professions of German citizens who had amorous relationships or close friendships with Jews. This was done to expose them to public contempt and ridicule. The relentless dragging of all those things that had once been private into the public realm was the hallmark of the emerging dictatorship and also a means of suppressing dissent. And there were countless murder cases. There is no data as to their precise number and German authorities were not interested in finding out the truth. The surviving documentary evidence permits us to classify anti-Semitic murders during the Nazi takeover into three categories. First, murders committed on the spur of the moment resulting from a violent attack. Second, the staged so-called shot while trying to escape murder and third, the planned revenge murders whereby victims and perpetrators often knew each other. We have one tangible figure from the American journalist Michael Williams who visited Germany from early April until mid-June. He mentioned the figure of about 300 murders and 3,000 other violent crimes, although this number was not based on any statistics or other concrete evidence. My own research places this figure within the range of probability. The anti-Semitic violence of the late winter and spring of 1933 would remain unequaled in scope and intensity until the nationwide pogrom of November 1938. Violence against Jews in Nazi Germany saw no steady increase between 33 and 38. After an explosive eruption at the beginning of the dictatorship, it receded in intensity, though it never disappeared entirely. And now we turn to the reaction to this violence. By early to mid-March, it had already become perilous for individuals to speak out. As I show in this book, social and political prominence was no shield against Nazi attacks. Nazi violence acknowledged no class differences and anyone, regardless of social standing, was a potential victim. This naturally raises the question, which institutions or political parties and the elites within them were still in a position to put pressure on the regime to stop the attacks or at least protest against them? Those democratic parties of the Weimar Republic that had traditionally opposed anti-Semitism were now fighting for their own survival and no longer in a position to help. Among political parties, only Hitler's alliance partner, the DNVP, that is, the conservative German National People's Party, retained vestiges of political influence. But, as shown in Before the Holocaust, conservatives were a doubtful last resort since their own past was tinged with anti-Semitism. An interesting case is the reaction of German bureaucrats who had to deal with complaints from foreign embassies and consulates. Officials in Saxony, for example, who were confronted with reports about maltreatment of Polish citizens, were caught in a real predicament. On the one hand, they were aware that national solidarity with Nazi perpetrators was expected of them. On the other, they knew well enough that the reports about attacks were true and that their commitment to the rule of law required action against the attackers. In the end, Concern with maintaining Germany's standing under the Nazis, as well as their own positions, prevailed. Saxon officials would thus distort the truth to protect the image of the German Reich. In order to render attacks less offensive, they often discredited victims by labeling them communists and subversive elements, or else emphasized their alleged immoral way of life. An SA attack on a synagogue in Dresden, for example, was justified by the claim that the SA had to break up a communist meeting there. All this was done to give the attacks a semblance of legality. The perversion of justice was also evident in the bureaucracy's reaction to murder cases, where affluent middle-class victims were slandered as communists who had planned to overthrow the German state, while the perpetrators were characterized as good Germans and staunch supporters 
of the National Revolution. These phony, drummed-up charges against victims would then permit prosecutors to release the criminals under a statewide amnesties, amnesty for crimes committed during the National Socialist Revolution. The reaction of the Protestant and Catholic church leadership was muted as well, even though both had come under pressure from some of their own members and from foreign churches to speak out against anti-Semitic violence. Protestant church leaders expressed their satisfaction with the new government since it had just saved Germany from falling under the communist yoke. Some feared that criticism of the government in the form of a public stand on behalf of Jews could be used as a propaganda weapon against the new Germany. Others worried that public comments against the government might rebound on the critics themselves. Therefore, prudence alone dictated restraint. Inactivity and silence would thus remain the position of the Protestant Church, even in the case of German Jews who had converted to Christianity. With German Catholics, the end result was the same. Why had there been so little resistance to anti-Semitism at the very beginning of the Nazi dictatorship? In the early days of Nazi rule, resistance and protest might well have changed the course of history. Why did German elites and German institutions observe in silence brutal attacks on their fellow Jewish citizens? As I show in this book, the short answer to this question lies in a mixture of fear, complacency, latent anti-Semitism, and an eagerness to please the new Nazi masters. The leadership of the bureaucracy, the churches, and the German National People's Party knew quite well what was happening. Their reactions were shaped by a mixture of indifference, indifference toward victims and enthusiasm for the new regime. Caution, fear, and blatant anti-Semitism in the case of the churches, and willing complicity within the bureaucracy, a blend of motivations that was characteristic of large sections of German society during the Nazi takeover. Individual protest against violent attacks was already hazardous in March and April, but established German elites were still able to voice their concern and raise objections. By doing so, they could have stopped a radicalization that eventually led to the Kristallnacht pogrom and the Holocaust. But the elites chose to remain silent and even became passively complicit in the outrages perpetrated against Jews in Germany. As a prominent historian once observed, the silence of the respectable people was just as important for the success of National Socialism as the bellowing of the enthusiasts. Before the Holocaust revises standard assumptions that physical violence against Jews only fully began in 1938 before escalating into the mass murder of the Holocaust, and it throws a revealing light on the reaction of German elites and institutions.